Traumatic brain injury as defined as any alteration in the brain function caused by an outside force. So these are things like your car accidents, your falls, your you know, big hits in football or assaults, anything like that. While an acquired brain injury, that can be like an infection, like a, like a herpes encephalitis or you know, if you get a really high uh, temperature, that can cause damage to your brain. All right. So now, so here's some common symptoms that uh, people who sustain a brain injury might complain of. First one is memory impairment, and this kind of varies on a case-to-case -case basis, obviously. So some people might have a hard time telling you, you know, what happened several weeks ago. While other people might have trouble recalling what happened a couple days ago. And there's even some people that can't tell you what happened a couple minutes ago. I worked with one individual who had about like a three-minute duration, right, or a retention rate. So he can remember things from like three minutes ago. After that, he kind of forgets. So you might have to reintroduce yourself to him several times throughout the day. Some people might say they have really bad headaches. Um, other people, especially people who've had traumatic brain injuries, uh, like car accidents, assaults, falls, they might have screws in their leg. You know, they might have stents in their head. Some interventions here, we have structure and consistency. So like you said, they have an impaired memory, so that structure and consistency, they can kind of learn, okay? Maybe I wake up in the morning, I brush my teeth, then I eat breakfast, and then I go to occupational therapy, then I go to lunch, okay? If I do that every day, I get into that rhythm and I can start to learn, all right? And my father had um, a subacromic hemorrhage, a pretty severe brain bleed where he was incontinent and he couldn't even like walk and talk and stuff like that. And um, but he knew when people were like treating him like, you know, because he knew the difference. Yeah. yeah. He didn't grow up with a developmental disability like Zach was saying. There's a whole different, you know, you know, and he didn't want to be spoken to like in a, in a way like he was a child. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's it just, the segues into a whole different thing, but we found that fluency worked. They told him he'd never uh, be talking again and let alone remembering certain things like phone number, but all I did was come home from West Virginia and drew all flashcards because that's what Julie taught me. I was doing fluency over and over and then like charting it and shit. And he, was get, he started getting into it and they started talking and then he was able to generalize it because of the fluency. He could, he could remember the phone number, but yeah, I mean, there was only so far he could come. I found, I learned the hard way, never ask what happened or anything like that. Let them tell you. It's kind of like a bonding and rapport building time as well. Um, you might come up to somebody, and I, I worked with people who have, you know, half their skull missing, but it's just like, all right, don't, don't acknowledge it, just talk like you would, and then if they want to open up and tell you, then they can, because it's a traumatic event, you know, might trigger memories of, from that day on, their life was different, you know, and it's something they don't like talking about, and sometimes, you know, they move at their own pace. We don't think about measuring behavior in your brain, because all, all of those automatic systems, right, those respondent systems, are covert, but they're not private behavior. They can be measured. We just don't have the tool. Like, I don't have the tools to measure, so I'm afraid when I go out there, right? So when I'm talking about behavior that I can observe and I can measure, it doesn't involve this, but that doesn't mean that it can't be. So, and if you think about how behavior that we would typically measure and observe happens, it starts in your brain. People used to misunderstand Skinner's vision, um, and because well, I would ask Julie all the time, I'm like, oh. I'm like, well, I know I have thoughts, and I know that my thoughts result in actions and so forth. And she, she would always say, yeah, and she would say, you know, her father always understood the, that there's these events occurring, these private events, and one day there'll be technology to measure these things. People misunderstood Skinner by thinking that he didn't want to consider private events, um, but they, the radical behavior analysts did consider them. They just couldn't measure them at the time. But he always said, and Julie always said, once there's technology to be able to do it, they could take things to another level. Going back to the what you had said about the effective interventions that you've seen being like behaviorally consistent, I find that that's true so frequently. So don't, you know, in just like your broader practice, don't be deterred by a description of an intervention that doesn't sound behavioral. If you're observing that it works, I find that's 
vast, vast, vast majority of the time. Even if someone says, oh, we're just doing this, that, and the other thing, and they're not giving you a behavioral description of it, they're not describing any of the principles, if you look more deeply into it, if it's working, it's so likely to be consistent with behavioral principles. So, so look at those things that are being effective, and, and you as a behavior analyst, try to nail down what about that that is happening is behavioral and so that you can systematize it and help generalize that throughout the programming. Well, these people might know that, you know, they lived a different life before their injury, okay? So that kind of hurts your pride. You want to put them in control as much as you can. Um, you don't want to come across as this authoritarian figure just telling them what to do all the time. Give them choice, have them make decisions for themselves. And of course, like I'm sure everyone in this room does, show empathy and respect for the individuals. Um, I used to work in a couple different brain injury rehabs and I remember just sitting there speaking to the people and it was just so eye-opening because sometimes the majority of the people in the room were more, you know, better educated than I was. They were, they were going to PhDs and medical doctors who one day just got in a car accident, had a stroke, and their life changed forever. And just to try to think of that about that when you're working with these people. It could be any of us, how scary is that, uh, that scene? I think I really think the future is going to be the future of behavior analysis is going to involve two major things artificial intelligence and so AI and then VR virtual reality so we're going to be able to have you know like the oculus and things like that we'll be able to um, engage in operant behaviors and then there'll be a virtual environment that reinforces them and they'll actually be robots and artificial intelligence that are mechanisms or uh, machine learning that's better at recognizing successful approximations than teachers are. They'll better shape things and know when to not reinforce a behavior that wasn't a successful approximation. When, when someone starts going backwards, we don't reinforce it, but a teacher might accidentally do it. But but the, the AI will be able to reinforce it. So I, I, I mean, I think it's going to be pretty incredible that when you combine um, covert tech, uh, behavior and measurement and then with AI and then artificial intelligence, we will be able to create really, really rapid learning in in learners' behavior as a result of that. And it'll it'll be more precise than the human error that occurs when mm -hmm. teachers make mistakes.